Good morning, people that are joining us. Um, please, as you can see, there's a map up of our state with the counties designated on it. If you can go up to your annotation feature or click on your the pen that helps you mark something on the map. If you're able to mark the county that you live in, that would be great. Just place a little star on the map using the pen in the annotation feature. And if you're not able to do that, pull up the chat and just let us know where you're coming in from this morning. <clears throat> I see the annotation the feature. And then from Pine. Good morning, Pine County. Welcome, everyone. As you come in, take a minute to mark on the map where you're coming in from. Or if you're not able to do that, just throw it in the chat. Let us know what county you're coming in from. It's great to see everyone coming on board. I myself am a little technologically defunct and don't can't mark the map. So I am Lisa Phoebe coming in from Sherburn County. Morning, everyone. I think for some reason the annotation feature isn't working again, Lisa. Oh, okay. So for some reason, staff just indicated the annotation feature isn't working. So just maybe type in the chat what county you're coming in from. That's working As you now. see, our county map is up. <laughs> and Central Minnesota Jobs and Training, which is hosting this this morning, covers 11 counties. But we're just curious where you're from. So if you can mark that in the chat so we get an idea of where people are from, that'd be great. Thanks everyone for taking a minute to type in the chat where you're coming on from. We have over 200 guests sign up this morning, so a large group. And I think it's just fun for all of us to know where, we, where we're coming in from. So as many of you know, Central Minnesota Jobs and Training and the Workforce Center covers 11 counties. And, but we have people coming in from a lot of different parts of the state. We've got North St. Paul, St. Cloud, Monticello, Cambridge, Wright. Lots of people coming on. Good morning, everyone, as you're coming on. Thanks for typing in the chat where you're joining us from, what county you are sitting in or represent, or where you work. This is going to be a larger meeting. We have about over 200 people signed up. So it just gives us a good idea where you're coming in from. More from Pine, we have people from Wilmer, Wright, Sherburn, Mora, Nobles County, down in Worthington, welcome. So we're just coming up at nine o'clock now, so we'll definitely give this a few more minutes. I know when I have a remote meeting or a Zoom meeting, I usually check in at about 
<laughs> so thanks for coming on early, early rises. We've got Bemidji, Beltrami, way up north. They covered their plants. And Stearns. Actually, we had a frost in, in the cities a couple nights ago. So, good morning, everyone. Thanks for checking in and signing in where you're coming from this morning. If you can take a minute just to type in where you're where you're coming to us from, what city, what town, what county, what state? Maybe we've got some out of state people. I haven't seen anyone. Morrison County, welcome. Elk River, great to see you on. St. Cloud, Hutchinson. Cambridge. Polk County, Cold Spring. Good to see everyone joining us this morning. I'm Lisa Phoebe from Sherburne County. I serve on the Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Workforce Development Board. Just want to welcome everyone this morning. <clears throat> We're still welcoming people and letting them in. We have quite a few people signed up, so we're going to give it a few more minutes before we get started. Welcome Malacca and St. Martin and Olivia. Thanks for sharing in the chat where you're coming in from. So we can get a sense of who's all gathering today. We've got Big Lake and Buffalo and Becker. Eagle Bend, welcome. People are still coming in. Welcome and good morning to everyone. When you come in, if you can just put in the chat where you're joining us from, just to get an idea of where everyone's from, that would be really helpful. And we'll let people trickle in for a couple more minutes before we get started. So thanks for your patience. A lot of people joining us this morning. This is what I used to have wake up my kids to in the morning when they lived at home. <laughs> I'm joking. Lisa Phoebe from Sherburn County facilitating this meeting. I serve on the Central Minnesota Job and Training uh, Board of Directors. So welcome and thank you for putting in the chat um, where you're joining us from. I'm gonna give it about one more minute as we let people in before we get started. Huh? Someone said, love the tunes. I usually get someone saying, oh, this brings me back to my childhood playing bingo in the basement of the Catholic church with my grandma. So that's what it reminds me of, my Polish grandma. So...
Okay, I'm going to stop the music. It's about five after nine, and we're going to get started with our presentation. So there, if you want to, thank you. Thank you, staff, for doing the magic with the technology. Um, good morning, everyone. As I was saying, I'm Lisa Foby. I'm a Sherburne County Commissioner, but I serve on the Central Minnesota Jobs and Training Board, the Workforce Development Board, and also the Government and Community Relations Committee, which is in which was charged with putting this together today. So really want to welcome everyone. Before we get started, I just want to be mindful and say a, just a, a minute, a second about Ian and Hurricane Ian and help us be to just take a minute to remember and think about, I think us as Minnesotans, every one of us knows someone in Florida or has someone connected to Florida or up the coast. And I know it's been on my mind a lot. So just thinking about those people and um, hoping for everyone's safety. So just one, there's always something bigger going on than all of us. So um, again, thank you for being here on behalf of Central Minnesota Jobs and Training and the Workforce Development Board. I wanna welcome everyone. Um, I'm the facilitator for this. I'm gonna give a quick shout out to the community and government relations folks who put this together. Craig Johnson is from Candy Ojai County, Bob Voss, Kanabic, Bob Dockendorf is Sherburne County, Mike Waring is Isanti County, Paul Bukovich is Meeker County, and Brian O'Donnell is McLeod County. And we're always looking for more board members on our Workforce Development Board. So I wanna put a quick shout out that we're looking for people from Wright County and Sherburne at this time, business owners. Be great if you wanna join us. You can contact me or Barb Chafee or anyone who's on staff. Um, I also want to thank staff behind the scenes. I don't know how to do all this, so I really appreciate the work that they keep us um, on the screen. Um, and with that, um, I think we're just going to jump right into our topic. Um, this is a big, you know, mental health is affects all of us every day and in our lives, big and small, personally, professionally. And we just felt like as a community and government relations committee, this was a topic um, that would be great to bring to our business people, our business owners, especially people that manage others, manage people, um, just uh, uh, something for themselves, for support, but also perhaps something that they could utilize in the work that they do in managing staff, because there come some challenges with that. So many of you possibly have heard of Melissa Pribble and the bounce back program through Centricare where it started. But this morning we have Melissa Pribble with us. She has been a registered nurse since 94 and has enjoyed many years caring for patients in cardiology and emergency department settings. Her transition to community health and wellness specialist at Centricare has brought a new focus in which to practice nursing with passion and enthusiasm. Melissa completed her master's degree in nursing leadership and management and thrives at working on big picture projects. Being part of the Bounce Back Project has been a rewarding way to bring mental wellness and resiliency to the local community and healthcare members. And I've worked with Melissa on a, a few things in our community and just always impressed with her. And I'm just thrilled to have her with us this morning. So I'm gonna turn this over to Melissa. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lisa, for the great introduction. And I love the music, love it. And it did remind me of being with my grandparents, but I went to the Lutheran church, so different basement. But all in all, um, great reminders of, and I was kind of moving shoulders. I didn't get up and dance a polka, but I was sure uh, wanting to, for sure. So good morning, everyone. Um, happy Friday. Um, it's a beautiful day here in Minnesota. Um, we're so lucky to be here and do get to count our blessings as Lisa reminded us of other parts of our country that aren't faring so well weather-wise right now. So our thoughts and certainly with them. So I, um, I do community health and wellness as mentioned and part of my role is doing Bounce Back Project work. Bounce Back Project is a, a community-wide resiliency project that started about uh, seven years ago in 2015. But before the presentation itself, I just wanna give you a bit of history about why the Bounce Back Project got started in the first place. 
So it started right in central Minnesota in the communities of Monticello and Buffalo, which are, as you know, probably are located in Wright County, about 10 miles apart by distance. And in those um, in those communities, we have health care options, right? So in Monticello, there's a center care facility right next door is an independently physician owned clinic called Stellis Health. 10 miles to our south in Buffalo is an Alina Health Hospital and another Stellis Health Clinic. And then in Albertville, not too far away from both cities, is another Stellis Health Clinic. And collectively, um, we help provide health care um, to all of the citizens in our local communities. So a really great working relationship. We've done this collaboratively for many, many years. And unfortunately, in 2014, we lost a couple of our physician partners. Um, if some of you were local to that uh, at that time, you might recall these un unfortunate um, circumstances where we lost an OBGYN doctor. He was a wonderful colleague and provider and friend who was out on a motorcycle ride on a beautiful sunny Saturday afternoon when a golf cart of all things crossed in front of his pass and he was killed instantly. And that was a very hard blow for everyone, right? He was a father of four young kids. He was a wonderful colleague, a great friend and provider within our communities. And it, it kind of reminded all of us um, that you never know what tomorrow is going to bring, right? How to remember to live each day to its fullest because who knows what our future holds. And we were reminded of that. And, and as we were moving forward and sort of healing from that loss and trying to figure out how to take care of us as a healthcare team, his own family, his patients, um, unfortunately, three months later to the day, we lost another provider to suicide. That provider took his own life at the Buffalo Hospital, right at work. And again, it just struck us to our core and we were like, holy buckets, here we go again. And now this time we've lost another friend and colleague and provider this time to suicide. And at that time, nobody really even knew he was dealing with something so big. And here's a group of healthcare providers, right? And you can imagine the answer or the questions that came up, like, why didn't he come to us for help? Why didn't we see that he needed help, right? And answers that we'll never have. Um, and so it reminded us again that we all have challenges that come to us on a daily basis. And we need to stay strong and resilient through those through those rough spots. And so we wanted to form a resiliency project and not just bring it back to our healthcare teams, but bring it back to our communities as a whole. Because our schools were experiencing teen suicides at that very same time, our whole community needed a message to keep us strong and resilient through the tough moments. And so the Bounce Back Project was created. And as you see as a tagline, they're promoting health through happiness. That's what our message is all about. Next slide, please. All right, so our partners, um, initially Alina, as I mentioned, was part of our part of our initiative, but it has pulled back to do a system-wide resiliency project and they're great, great supporters of Bounce Back Project to this time. But right now, Center Care is at the lead of Bounce Back Project with our partnership still in Stellis Health. So we're uh, forging ahead um, with this group in mind and um, doing great work around our central Minnesota regions. Next slide. So what is Bounce Back Project in the first place? Well, it is a unique grassroots collaborative that initially had, you know, physicians and nurses and healthcare leaders, great support from our leadership, uh, community members on board. We have community teams that have taken off from it as well. And the single purpose of all of us working together is to impact the lives of individuals, organizations, and our communities by promoting health through happiness. Next slide. And we do this by doing what I'm doing today, really sharing that message of resiliency and those great reminders of easy uh, tools that all of us can use on a daily base, basis to expand our resilience. And when we do that, we're really retraining our minds to focus on the positives that are literally right in front of us every day, thereby increasing feelings of well-being and decreasing feelings of depression. So today we're gonna kind of focus on the top four tools that we talk about, random acts of kindness, three good things, gratitude and social connections. But we do have further presentations on mindfulness and self-care, the importance of purpose, and then we've just added now confidence and adaptability. So something to keep in mind when you're looking for tools for your teams or your organization, um, certainly we might be a resource to you. Next slide. All right, so first a great reminder, let's review what resilience is. And, and I know it's kind of like a, a word we've heard way too much over the last couple of years, right? With dealing with our pandemic, reminders from near and far to keep yourself strong, keep yourself resilient. But the fact of the matter is it's still an important topic. Next slide. 
So we've always talked about resiliency as our ability to bounce back from the stressful parts of life, right? We as human beings, we know that there's going to be a lot of great days, but there's going to be tough, challenging days along the way, especially as leaders, as business owners, as CEOs and whatnot. Um, there's going to be a lot of rough patches that you're going to have to handle, right? So how do we develop some good coping skills to deal with these stressful situations when they come and learning how being resilient really helps us learn how to better take care of ourselves for what lies ahead um, because we know you know tough days might be around the corner and it just allows us to be a healthier better you next slide recently i was at a conference just a couple weeks ago and they had this new definition of resiliency and i wanted to share it with you guys because i love it so resiliency is the process of moving forward in a new way realizing we will never return to what was but what life might become the process of bouncing forward. And I absolutely love it, right? Because I think for so long, all of us really wanted things to just get back to normal. And we know that that's not gonna happen now. We've we've come to terms, I think that this is, we're moving forward now, right? But now we have this opportunity ahead of us to realize what life could become, right? And really bouncing forward at this point and becoming more resilient and, and looking forward to the future. Next slide. So we all, most of our tools come these, from these five um, pillars of resilience. So today we're not gonna focus on self-care, but we are gonna talk about it a little bit because you know that if you don't take care of you, you know, you don't have nothing left to give. And as leaders in your organizations, you have to make sure that you're at your best. So how do you take care of you so that you are able to support those, um, those that you work with, those that you mentor, those that you um, support within your within your business or organization. How about self-awareness? I think that's become ever so important over these last couple of years. Like, how do I want to be seen and heard in this world? Right. Over the course of the pandemic, there's been so many different opinions like mask and not mask and vaccinate and not and all these different things. And, you know, our our um, our thoughts and actions and our words and actions really make a difference on how we're seen as a leader in our organization, as a, a member in our family or, you know, out in our communities. So certainly self-awareness is something that we need to um, uh, take into consideration. How about your purpose? not just your professional purpose, right, which we do every single day, but how about your personal passions? Are you pursuing a purpose outside of your busy, busy work life? Thinking about mindfulness, you know, don't fret about tomorrow because <laughs> it's not here yet. And don't worry about what happened yesterday because it's already passed. But how do we really take advantage of today, of this day and make sure we're living it to its fullest? And then certainly the importance of relationships. We'll talk a little bit more about how important social connections are for our overall wellness. Next slide. So I got a quick question for you. Hey, has anyone's resilience been tested lately? Oh my goodness, right? Especially in this business world that you guys are our leaders in, you know, the email box, the email, it just never ends. It's always overwhelming. Every time you log in, they're there, they're staring in the face. You don't know which ones are important, the which ones don't, could you weed out? You got to go through them all, right? Respond when you can. People are looking for help all over the place. It's hard to find staff. Um, you're working short. Your current employees are working overtime. They're exhausted as you are. Um, more Zoom meetings than we can probably stake, shake a stick at. You know, you've got people working from home or doing hybrid and, you know, making sure the um, all of our IT stuff is in place and working fine. And then there's this darn little virus. This old virus just keeps hanging around, knocking on the door every now and then and, and poking its head where it doesn't belong, right? We're dealing with a lot of things. And so our resilience has been tested over the last couple of years more than we could have imagined. And that's at all ages, right? From young um, young kids within the school district who had to change everything about education to our senior citizens who are still um, figuring out how to navigate in these new in this new world we're living in. So I think we've all been tested sometimes to our to our limits, but we're moving forward nonetheless. Next slide. The best part about resilience for all of us is that we can learn to do it better. So looking at the cup, the, the picture on the screen, you know, you look at it as either a cup half empty or a cup half full. Either answer is correct, right? I mean, and we all kind of look through life through a lens of maybe half empty or half, half full, but we're human beings after all. Some of us are on both sides of that coin. Um, but the best part about resiliency is if we practice it without our in, within our daily lives and being consistent about it, that is the key. 
the more we practice, the better we get, right? We don't have to be perfect at it, but just striving for perfection and adding a little tool for resiliency every now and then within your daily life is the key to becoming more resilient. Now, I by nature am a cup half full kind of gal. That's that's who I am by nature. My parents were, you know, that's who I am. I'm thankful for that. But my husband, on the other hand, he comes from kind of a cup half empty kind of family. <laughs> you know, that's who they are. They sort of have this like, you know, lens that they're like uh, a little bit more questioning, right? And I'm raised in two half cups. I have two now young adult sons who are by nature kind of half cups. And I tell you, when the times get tough at the Pribble household, I call them all my quarter cups. I tell you what, certain days I'm like, come on guys, you can do this, right? But that's a struggle, right? It's a struggle for all of us. Perhaps when we have these differing lenses that we view life on, right? We have some who are more the negative Nellies or whatnot. And it's hard. We work next to those people. We're leading those people. They're in the cubicle right here. They're sitting at the same group of adult, you know, the same group of leadership that we're we're trying to move forward with projects and stuff. And we have, you know, maybe a, a lens or a cup half empty person who's kind of, you know, adding their input. And that's okay because we need both sides. But how do we make sure that nonetheless that people who are cup hefty are, are finding the good stuff, right? Because we want them to be their healthiest self. Next slide, please. And resilience does help you live longer. Our, you know, studies show that you can live up to 10 years longer, 10 years by, be, by being more resilient throughout your life. Now, why didn't somebody share this with us when we were in middle school, right? We could have benefited all these years of being more resilient. So that's what Bounce Back Project is now. We're trying to share it with young, young people for sure. But there's physical resilience. Probably the one we're most um, familiar with is our physical resilience, keeping our physical bodies healthy, right? Don't sit still too long, get up, be active, eat healthy, you know, play tennis, lift weights, do golfing, do, you know, yoga, whatever it might be. But then there's also mental resilience, making sure that we are tackling tiny goals that boost our brains and our body's willpower, right? Like maybe you're somebody who do, does the wordle of the day, or maybe you just like good old fashioned jigsaw puzzles like my mom and, and her husband who are in their mid seventies, right? Keeping their brain sharp. Or maybe you are setting a goal to run a half marathon in the spring, or you're setting a goal to lose the COVID-19 that you've gained. <laughs> That's me, right? Or maybe it's up to 21 now, I'm not sure, but either way, it's way too much. This working from home thing is tough. But what are these things that are keeping us sharp and ready for those next challenges in our everyday life? There's emotional resilience. How do we make sure that we're achieving that three to one positive emotion ratio each and every day? And what that means is it takes at least three positives to outweigh everyone negative. And a recent study I read was five to one. So there's a lot of intentional positives you know, we have to be intentional about it to outweigh the negatives that sneak into our everyday lives. And then lastly, social resilience, really building and maintaining those relationships with people that are important to you. So all components of resiliency for our overall wellness. Next slide. But, you know, you might be saying this sounds great, but I'm the boss. So who is looking out for me, right? You may be feeling isolated because you know you're you're the top level here right like who are you supposed to go to with your concerns right you're supposed to be the one setting the tone for your meeting for your staff for your organization so you got to be at your best all the time you got you're always on right on on stage you can't share this information with anyone you know it's a confidential issue it's a legal issue like i can't take this to just anyone who am i supposed to share this with or what, are you, what if you're thinking to yourself, I'm exhausted. I'm so darn exhausted, but so are my employees. So how am I supposed to take a day off when they don't get one? You know, I need to set the example here. Perhaps you're saying, I don't have the answer. When people come to me with questions and concerns and I don't know the answer, who am I supposed to ask? Or maybe you're just at that day where you're like, can I just lock my office door and pretend I'm not here, right? This has happened, I think, for all of us. These days come to us when we're like, who am I supposed to go to when I need a break? Who am I supposed to go to when I need help or an answer or somebody to look out for me? All right, next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit about some quick and easy resilience tools that all of us can do, right? We, because we want you and your teams to be at your best. And when you're at your best, we know that that's going to filter down to the teams that you support, the organization that you represent, and the people that look up to you as their leader. Next slide. 
We are going to start with random acts of kindness because when Bounce Back Project kicked off their work in 2015, this is where we started. Random acts of kindness we figured was a great place to start in our communities because it was familiar. People were always already doing random acts of kindness throughout their everyday lives, and so we just wanted to push them a little bit further. Because what you might not know about random acts of kindness is that when you do something kind for someone else, you increase their happiness level for up to 24 hours. It's not just because it's a kind thing to do. It actually increases their happiness for 24 hours. It has this lasting effect. But what even better you might not be aware of is that when you do a random act of kindness for someone else, your own happiness increases for up to two weeks. And there's the win, right? There's the win. There's the increase in your resiliency when you're needing it most, sharing kindness in our communities, within your organization, out you know, with your family or whatnot, is boosting your resiliency because it's increasing your happiness and your ability to handle the tough stuff. Next slide, please. Doing a random, doing a, an act of kindness produces that single most reliable momentary increase in well-being than any exercise that's been tested. So think about all the things we do for our physical health, right? We, you know, we people run marathons for crying out loud, God bless them. You know, we do, you know, people play pickleball and people um, do yoga and go to the gym and lift weights and, and seek out all these avenues for physical health. But when it comes to doing a random act of kindness, that's that mental and emotional health that we know we need so much. It's an overall feeling of well being, right? That we need not just our physical bodies, but internally as well. And that's from Dr. Martin Seligman, who's a, a, a guru on, on, uh, on resiliency for sure. So when we rolled this out into our community, we asked them and we challenged them to do random acts of kindness. Those, so these are historical pictures, but I like to share them nonetheless. We asked them, what have you seen and what have you done? So on the left, you see a $10 tip for someone at one of the local hotels with a little post-it note that says random act of kindness. Because I want to remind you that sometimes kindness can come with a piece of paper and pen. Right? Paper and pen are powerful tools. Kindness doesn't have to cost anything. A nice message of kindness, think how far that goes to some of your team, to some of your staff who helped you get through a challenging day or a whole day of meetings and kept you on track, kept you on schedule, right? Or somebody popped up and, and really did something kind for you. You know, they brought you a treat that they baked last night. Hey, Thanks for the wonderful brownies. What a great way to make my day, you know, or whatever it is. Don't forget that kindness can be shared with a post-it note for crying out loud, right? In the bottom we got left, we have a little hospital humor. That is some, you know, candy after a holiday shared within the hospital in a clean bedpan. I'm telling you, it was clean. That's the kind of things we do at the hospital. Got to get a few laughs. We couldn't find a bowl. Um, then there's five dollars in a red box DVD for the next person who got it. Five bucks and a little note that says enjoy some snacks on us. How cool would that be, right? In the middle, we got a couple extra quarters at the car wash with the Bounce Back Project Instant Joy card. We're creating that ripple effect of kindness by handing out these small business cards that says consider this a random act of kindness. So as you're sharing maybe a mint, you know, out of your pocket without the lint or maybe an extra cookie that you brought into work on Friday or a color, a picture that your kid colored and you want to share. Okay, so did Melissa freeze for all of you? Yes, she froze for me as well. Yes. yes. Okay. okay, I'm gonna call her. Hang on, maybe I should put the music back on. Hi, Melissa. You just... This is Lisa Phoebe. You just froze. Okay. 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 See you in a, there you are. Okay. She's on her way back in. Technology. So I was a little challenging. Melissa.
So maybe while we're waiting for Melissa, if people can um, type in the chat, what are some acts of kindness maybe that you've done or some that you've seen happen that moved you? So we're, while we're waiting to get reconnected to Melissa, what are acts of kindness you have done or what has been, what have you seen done? A resilient through tech issues. Thank you, Bridget. Yes. I know that she's trying to get back on, so thanks for your patience. I'm going to, I'll maybe read some of these as they come up. Paid for the next customer's meal, bought lunch for the car behind me in the drive through handed out reusable bags at Aldi's, employee luncheon. Um, someone said, my chef lost her dog, so I bought her a cute stuffed dog to help cheer her up. Buy coffee at the drive-thru for the next car. Bring in veggies from the garden or apples from their trees. Bring in lunch from home to share. Monica says, when we were about to take our daughter into the hospital for brain surgery, our pastor dropped off an anonymous $1,000 gift to us. Wow. Paid for kids lunch fund that was overdue. Lots of great ideas and good suggestions. I know I go through phases in life where I try to hand write a note daily to someone and it lifts me up like Melissa was saying. Um, while out at Coburn's years ago, a gentleman just came up and put his card in the payment option while we were getting ready to pay at the deli. It was amazing. He apparently does that every couple of weeks. Nice thing for our kids to see and experience. Tip the lady who makes breakfast at the hotel. Yes. Provided a few words of support, encouragement for someone who is being beaten up on social media. Ooh, that social media is a tough thing right now. Meal fixings for the staff at my mom's care center on holidays with thank you notes. Buffalo Lake Hector School District has a random acts of kindness program with the students weekly and monthly. It has had a huge impact on the kids. Starting this early is great. Meals sent to coworkers. I'm just going to check in on my phone to see where, um, if I'm sure staff, Lori Campa and others are trying to work at getting Melissa reconnected. Um, thanks for your patience. Bringing fruit to employees for Wellness Wednesday, notes of appreciation for our staff, pay compliments and encouragement to people I meet. So great. I really apologize for this, and I'm no help with this kind of stuff. So I have a feeling there's a few people behind the scenes scurrying around, and I'm grateful for them. Um, and thanks for your patience. Why don't we take a stretch break? Everyone, maybe put your uh, camera off for a minute and grab another cup of coffee or a glass of water while I check in with um, our staff and Melissa to see how we're going to proceed here.
Hi, Lori. Hello. This is Melissa. Hi. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. This, so, Melissa, this is Lisa. I had people, I had them put in the chat what acts of kindness they've seen or what they've done. So you'll see a string of those when you see the chat. And then now they're taking a stretch break, getting a cup of coffee or a cup of water. And then I will call them back maybe in about 30 seconds, okay? Yeah, so I'm on my phone, just to let you know. I'm on my phone and I am not able to join the meeting for whatever reason, it kicked me right out. So I'm gonna continue to talk by phone. I'm gonna bring up my slide deck personally because I know exactly what you guys are showing. Yeah. So, um, and then I'll just tell you when to advance to the next slide, if that works out okay. Okay, so and yeah, people, so, people had some so great things. The, awesome, what, we're still on the Ramp Acts of Kindness picture slide, is that correct? Correct. Okay, perfect, then we'll just take off as soon as you uh, um, get them back, then I will uh, continue on from there. I'm so sorry, it just ticked me right off. <laughs> wow. So um, if people want to come back to join us, uh, Melissa is joining us by phone and not able to get on. So apologize for that. But she is going to join us by phone to finish the presentation. And I thank everyone for all their great uh, acts of kindness that they've seen or what they've done. Uh, someone said they buy someone coffee each week at work randomly. They bring fruit around to Employees for Wellness Wednesday, um, pay compl compliments and encouragement to people and meet. I meet and you can see their eyes light up when they're recognized. So really a lot of great ideas. I appreciate that and welcome everyone back. Melissa's going to join us by phone. We won't see her and we will work through her, her slide deck with her. So take it away, Melissa. All right, thanks you guys. Thanks for adding your random acts of kindness. That's lovely. And think about where you can do something like this, a challenge to your own employees, right? Everybody's got cameras at the ready nowadays. So perhaps you do a, you know, a two week kindness challenge or do a random act of kindness this week and let's share them all on Friday. Or, um, you know, maybe you just kind of give them a, encourage them to do some random act of kindness, knowing how important it is for their overall resilience right? Knowing that it increases their happiness for two weeks, why not? Why not throw a random act of kindness um, email out or a challenge to your coworkers? Next slide, please. All right, so the greatest thing about kindness is that it does have an impact on people who witness it. So as we are going about in our communities or within our organizations and completing kindness gestures, other people are seeing it happen. And so when we do something kind, oxytocin, which is the love hormone or the trust hormone, is released in our bodies. Um, the same thing happens for those who actually just are witnessing the random acts of kindness, thereby increasing their level of kindness and generosity as well. It's a wonderful side effect, if you will, of, of kindness. And when we see other people doing kindness, kind gestures in the community, it also gives that chance for us to sort of take a momentary um, you know, glimpse at our life and create this peak experience of gratitude and our ability to be content with we, where we are at, right? Allows us to say how lucky we are as human beings to have, well, for instance, right? A house that's intact, uh, you know, good weather. I think maybe she got kicked off again. Oh, shoot. Okay. Um, Can you hey still hear me? me? Yes, there oh, you're back, back, Melissa. You were gone for a little yes. bit, but now you're back. Okay. My goodness, what's happening here in beautiful Minnesota? <laughs> I didn't ever lose my phone signal. All right. So, three good things. We are kicking off three good things. Actually, three good things. It, it happens in October, and we are going to tell you all about what three good things is. Next slide, please. Three good things is just that, writing down three good things every single day. And the best time to do it is do it before bedtime because that's, you remember best what you've kind of reviewed over the last two wakeful hours. And so what are the three good things that went well today? And, and what was your role in making them happen? And for best results, you write it down for two weeks of time. 
So 14 days of three good things has a way of increasing your happiness for up to six months, six months, which is incredible. This simple and easy exercise has this lasting ability. And why that happens is because over two weeks of time, you are actually retraining your brain to focus on the positive that are right in front of you every day. You know, I think as adults, we think that good, you know, three good things have to be big and momentous, but they don't. They want, you want them to be your everyday good things, like a great cup of coffee in the morning or a walk with your dog after work or, you know, laughter from your grandchildren when you got to talk to them via phone last night. Or maybe you're going to have a, a great cup of coffee with a, with a friend over lunch today, or you're going to see a movie with your family this weekend, right? So there's three good things in every single day. So even on the toughest and most challenging days, hopefully we can find three good things. And as we write them down for two weeks on, you know, at a time, we can benefit from that for six months of greater happiness. This, this effective tool, this tool is found to be so effective that the physicians at Stella's Health, the clinics that I told you about, they actually prescribe this to their patients. It's found to be just as effective as the SSRIs or antidepressants such as Prozac and Zoloft. So this is pretty darn effective and it's really great for young people. So, I mean, we have a template that actually Lori is going to share with you guys via email and um, you can print several of those out and share them in your break rooms, share them with your coworkers. I encourage you to do one of your own, find three good things um, for sure over the next couple of weeks. And you can also do it around the supper table. That's what me and my family did. Um, I had two teenage kids at the time who weren't going to write down anything for good old mom, right? So when I asked them at the supper table, you know, to tell me something good that happened today, I sat there in silence for a little bit. They didn't have nothing to share. It made my heart sad a little bit, right? So then I finally asked my two teenage kids, like, hey, tell me something good that happened today, guys. What did you have for lunch today? And they're like, corn dogs. And I'm like, thank goodness you both like corn dogs. Let's write it down. So my family started with corn dogs, believe it or not. And we we went from there, right? Because on the toughest days, it's kind of hard to think of things that are going well. So I encourage you to try this and remember the things that are right around you. And so as you go over the two weeks of time, you're going to start to look through it for them throughout your day. Maybe on your drive into work, you're going to notice the sunrise or the beautiful sunset if you're working too long, right? Or deer off in the distance or a football game happening, you know, uh, at a local, local um, stadium or whatnot. So how do we find the good things that are right in front of us every single day? Next slide, please. The best thing is research and clinical trials show that there's less burnout and depression when you're thinking of the three good things each day. Better work-life balance, less conflict at home, work, or school, higher levels of happiness as just reported, and then certainly better sleep quality. If you go to bed with a peaceful mind reviewing the good parts of your day, that's so much better, right? Then thinking about all the things you have to do tomorrow or what didn't get finished today or what the news happened to report. There's a lot of not so great stuff happening in our world. How do we make sure that we're reflecting on the good stuff and concentrate on that as we head off to sleep at night? Next slide. So right now, if you could, I'd like to um, have you share in the chat. You've already shared some random acts of kindness. Thank you. But I'd love for you to write in one good thing that happened today already. We know it's early in the morning, but certainly somebody's had a great cup of coffee or hit all green lights on the way to their workspace today. Let's see what good things are happening. And Lisa, if you could share a few with us, that would be great. I'll start by sharing my, sharing my own. I am typing right now, amazing sunrise and patient participants. Yes. Um, other, someone said the sunrise. I saw a white-tailed deer. We saw two rainbows today. I woke up with air in my lungs. Ugh. We ordered breakfast at work. Got a beautiful message from my daughter out of state. So good. Feeling rested. Someone just dropped off fresh vegetables. Running water and shelter, someone said. Yes. And with all so that's good. going on. Yeah. I get choked up, I have to be honest. Um, both of my boys told me they loved me this morning. Ah. 
my goodness, that's such a great start to a day. Yeah, and what you guys notice about the list is this is everyday good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. These are things that we sometimes take for granted on, on, on most days, right? But on the toughest, toughest days, we got to go back to the basics. You got to remember that you got shoes, right? Or that when we flip a switch, the lights come on. Or we turn on our showers and we have hot water, right? Somebody mentioned that. We are so lucky. We have so many good things. Our food in our cupboard, right? Our car that works. All these great things in our everyday life. Next slide, please. And the reason that we really have to focus on this is because the challenge in our lives is that the negative screams at us when the positives only whisper. So this from Barbara Fredrickson, another person who works on resiliency. It is so true, isn't it? That when something negative happens, it consumes us. It overwhelms us and distracts us from everything at hand. Let's say for instance, you had an argument with your teenager on the way out the door this morning. Are you not distracted on your complete drive into work, right? Your mind is still distracted. What should I have said different? Should I, eat? Should I text him and say something different? Is he going to get more mad? I mean, it just overwhelms you, right? Or maybe you got an email from a staff member or you had to email staff members about something, you know, not so great news or a, a new report that was not as positive as you would have hoped. And, and now it's consuming you to be thinking of, of your staff and how they're re responding to this and whatnot. We have so many things that derail us from focusing on the positives in their everyday life. Next slide, please. And the problem is negativity is hardwired in our human brains. That's literally how our human brains are built. And that's to protect us, right, from harm and danger and injury and illness, survival of the fittest, right? But consequently, when negative things happen, they stick with us often for a lifetime, right? Think about the things that happened when you, when you were a child, right? Negative things that came with those negative emotions of embarrassment or anxiety or fear or anger, negative things that tell they stick with us because they are just wired um, in our brains to, to stick with us to help us avoid them in the future. But we don't often forget. And when we're having a challenging day, those are the, me the messages and the mem memories that weed their way back into our brains. Next slide, please. But on those most challenging days, we have to go back to the best things in life that are free, right? If you're struggling with, you, with your list of three good things on any given day, go back to this list, right? The ability to have great friends and hang out with them, right? How about good sleep, right? Or waking up with fresh, fresh air in your lungs, as somebody mentioned this morning, right? How about a nap on a Saturday afternoon? Whew, who doesn't look forward to that, right? Making good memories with our family, with our coworkers, within our communities. How about laughter? Laughter is so healthy for you. It lowers your blood pressure. It boosts your immune system. Did you know that kids on average laugh 200 to 300 times a day? Oh, my goodness. Little giggle monsters, each and every one of them. But when we are adults, four to ten times a day. And a lot of people don't think they laugh that much. How sad is that, right? Our lives get busy. Our life gets chaotic and hectic. And we forget to laugh. And as leaders in your organizations, as leaders, business owners, we have a lot that's got, you know, that's putting pressure on all of us. How do we make sure to bring laughter into each and every day, right? When you hear laughter at work, seek it out. Hey, if you can laugh, if you can laugh at work, you're in the best place possible, right? If you work at a place that allows you to laugh and enjoy life, that's the place. That's the place you want to be. And so um, think of how to bring laughter into your business, into your organization, whether that's adding a little funny joke to your, your email to your staff. Maybe you're going to embed a short little YouTube video that's kind of a little funny and, and get people sort of in that laughing mindset. Um, how about at a meeting? Maybe you're hosting a meeting for your staff, an all-staff meeting, and you start with a little bit of a good story or something that brings laughter to the group. It's so important to bring laughter into our lives. And then, of course, the smiles and family and all these other good things in, in life that are free. Next slide. We have a great opportunity coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Um, we do three good things every single, every single year, twice a year, in October and again in April. So we have also shared this flyer with Lori, who can email it out to all of you participants. If you would like to share this with your staff, we welcome you to do so. Anybody can join us by texting the word bounce back to that phone number. And then they're included in our Three Good Things text messaging campaign starting on October 16th. So instead of writing it down on paper, we know that people have their phones handy most of the time. 
at 8 p.m. each night, they would get a text message asking them about their three good things. And it's an ability for us to do this um, in a great, um, in a great modern way, right? To people to prepare, for people to do two weeks of three good things. So share that with one and all, share it within your family, um, text your friends, let them know the same. We'd love to get a whole group of us doing it together. Next slide, please. We're moving on to gratitude. Gratitude, which is a powerful beast, one of my favorite tools to bounce back project. Gratitude is really important. And the next slide, next slide please, will show you why, right? We know this line exists, the complaint line. It exists in retail, it exists at restaurants, you know, people are complaining, right? It exists in healthcare, it exists within our organizations. If people, our coworkers, our friends, our communities, if people do not like what's going on, they will let you know, right? They're good about asking to talk to the manager or, or emailing the boss or sending, you know, a letter to the editor or putting it on Facebook and, you know, a, a hundred people respond in the next 10 minutes, right? We know that when people don't like what's happening, they're really easy and quick to complain in this world. But unfortunately, we're not really great about sharing gratitude, even when it's warranted. So how do we shift this line to the right? How do we model and mentor gratitude so that we can raise the next generation of resilient human beings, right? How do we make sure that we're sharing gratitude in our organizations when it's warranted? I mean, you think about what we've experienced just this morning, all the pieces and parts that went together to making this presentation work, and then my Wi-Fi drops, right? So think about all the work. I'm so thankful for all of you and for Lori and, and Lisa to be putting this together and keeping us moving forward. So I'm sharing my gratitude one and one and all for all of you. But that's the kind of things we need to do to make people feel welcome, to make people feel um, supported in your organizations. share gratitude. Next slide, please. As we are all living a life of gratitude, that's a gift we can give ourselves. Because with gratitude and living that kind of life comes decreased depressive symptoms, increased feelings of well-being, better working memory. I don't know about you guys, but I'll take every ounce of memory I can get my hands on these days, right? Better sleep, because again, you're thankful for the things that you have in your everyday life. You're thankful for what life is giving you and being content. And so you're not going to bed restless, right? You're not going to bed figuring out the next best thing. You're thankful for what you have. Your immune system um, stays healthier and functions better. So you get through the tough spots from the health perspective. You have better relationships with other people. And you're certainly the kind of boss people want to work for. You're the kind of people, uh, person people want to hire, right? You're the kind of friend people want to hang around when you're finding the positives in your everyday life. We've all met that negative nature, that negative Nelly, right? Those people that are kind of always the naysayers or finding the negatives, they're always pointing out the not so great things that have happened. It's exhausting. Frankly, it's hard to hang around those people for any length of time. So how do we live, how do we not be that person, right? How do we live a life of gratitude and make sure that we're finding the positive and the thing to be thankful for in our everyday lives? And then certainly with that becomes the ability to handle the emotional upheavals in life, the ups and downs, right? As we are living a life of gratitude, we can make sure that the highs stay high and the lows are not quite so low. Now, you know, we're human beings after all, so we can give ourselves a little bit of grace. There's going to be days that are going to challenge us to our core. And it's okay to wallow a little bit in our pity every now and then, right? But what would we say at Bounce Back Project is it's okay to visit misery, but you can't live there, right? So as you have those low spots in your day, in your week, in your month or year, it's okay to take a day and, you know, and say, you know what? That day sucked. This day sucked. My goodness. I don't ever want to have a day like that again. But we also know that we got to get back up. We got to pull ourselves up and we got to get back up because it's not okay to be stuck down there. We've met those people, right, in our personal and professional lives who are kind of stuck in a rut. So how do we make sure that we help ourselves and help those people find, find their way back to living a life of gratitude? Next slide, please. And Bounce Back Project shows up in different ways. When we are out and about in our communities, we do different things to really kind of share, showcase the tools that we're talking about today. So this example that you're seeing for our community gratitude board is really, um, a, it's an example again of the power of piece of paper and pen. 
right? So we were out in an event that happened to be in Monticello, and um, we rolled this piece of paper out, and we asked Monticello, what are you grateful for? And as you can see, we had colored pens, and people filled up two boards that day at our party in the park event. And they wrote all kinds of different things. Like they were grateful for their faith and their family and friends, rainbows, butterflies, ice cream, watermelon, shoes, my husband of 29 years, all these different things. What a great thing to be standing behind the table that day and saying, now this is why I live here, right? Two people stuck with me that day. <clears throat> one of those was an older individual. She was in a wheelchair because she had an amputation above, above the knee on one side. And I was helping her get situated to write on her board that day. And when she left, I saw that she wrote she was most grateful for her grandchildren and her one good leg. And I thought, you know what? That lady's got it figured out. I want to be friends with that kind of lady, right? Because instead of harping through life about the, the leg she's missing, she's most grateful for the one she still has. And that's amazing, right? Turning something negative into quite a positive. And then there was this little guy. He was about, I don't know, three or four years old. And I was handing him a beach ball that day. And I said to him, what makes you happy, buddy? And he said, keep. He said it so fast, I wasn't quite sure I understood him. And I looked at his grandma, who he was with, and I said, quiche? Keys? And she goes, oh, no, keys. He loves keys. You know, this little guy carried a whole set of keys with him. You know, like those little plastic keys that you have when you're kids or those junk drawer keys that we all still have. He loves keys. And the reason I'm sharing that with you, because I think it's a great reminder for all of us to have that simple thing, that simple thing in our everyday lives beyond fa family and friends that brings us joy. So when you're struggling throughout your day, is there a go-to that you have? Like maybe you're one of those people, one of those bosses, you're like, man, I'm going to get a Snickers bar. Snickers bar will turn this day around. Or maybe you're someone who enjoys a great cup of coffee or a hot tea. Or maybe you know when you've had a horrible day that you're going to take your dog for a walk and just kind of close out your mind and close out the day. You know what it is for me? Dove chocolate. Man, I love a good milk, milk, milk chocolate to goodness with that sweet little message inside. That'll turn my day around a little bit, right? And so what is it? Is it listening to 80s rock music all the way home, singing at the top of your lungs, you know, shaking your hair, uh, wishing you still had a mullet? What is it, right? So in the chat right now, I would love for you to write in something beyond family and friends, that little something that is your go-to um, that can kind of turn your day around. And Lisa, if you could share a few with us, I would love to hear what you say. Okay. So what is it that can turn your day around? Picking my garden veggies. I was going to put going for a walk to clear my head, and there's lots. A walk outside, going for a walk, uh, going outside and hearing the birds, going for a run, lots of physical activity. When I can get lunch break at the gym. When my coworkers or friends share a funny meme or video with me, and it makes me laugh. Walking near the lake with my bestie. Chips and salsa. <laughs> Praise music. Gardening music and playing with my dogs. Awesome. Those are awesome. Thank you guys for sharing those. And I love that because think about, we have to have something, right? We, we all have to have something that we enjoy that when we're facing those challenging days, we have a little bit of a go-to, and not just for us. Think about your executive assistant at work. You know, if you know you've kept her busy all day long, and you know that her favorite thing is, I don't know, red licorice, hey, on a really busy day, grab her a pack of red licorice, right? Turn her day around. Or maybe you've gotten text messages all day long from your spouse letting you know that they've just had a really challenging day, and you know that they enjoyed, I don't know, a fountain pop from holiday. <laughs> grab them a Diet Coke on the way home, right? How do we make sure that we know like some of the go-tos for the important people in our lives so that we can, you know, share gratitude for them, that we, we appreciate them as a human being, but also knowing that, you, you know, you can turn their day around by a little something, right? So, and then looking at this gratitude board, where could this show up? Where could this show up in your organization, right? Do you have an extra whiteboard 
you know, that's not being used in the break room area? Do you have a big piece of paper such as this that you could hang in the lobby and you could ask your employees and maybe your clients or guests to share what they're grateful for? Because we have a lot to learn by reading other people's entries, right? Because it reminds us that we too are grateful for that small thing in our everyday lives. Maybe you send it out in your Friday email and say, you know what, this week I'd love for you to share what you're most grateful for in your, in your personal and professional lives. We do this at our meetings at Center Care. It's actually a standing agenda item. It is on the written agendas and it never leaves that we start with a mission moment. And that often boils down to, you know, share something positive that's happening in your personal professional life, share, share someone that you're grateful for. So think about having um, something like this as your meeting openers, right? It really sets the tone for the meetings and it can help you kind of spin the meeting into a positive, even when you have to share challenging or, you know, challenging information with the rest of your staff. And so make sure you're using something like this to um, let your coworkers know uh, what they're grateful for and be able to share with the remaining um, rest of the group. All right, turning to the next slide, please. In Bounce Back Project, we also share how important it is for us to share gratitude in the form of a gratitude letter. So think about a, a thank you card size letter, like 250 words or less, because what studies show is that when you write a gratitude letter to someone who's made a difference in your life, you can increase your happiness for up to six months. And again, another simple and easy tool that all of us can utilize. So who in your life has made a difference along the way? Like oftentimes we don't get to these positions in our world by not having a lot of help along the way. Another boss, you know, that we've had who taught us the tips and, tips and tricks of the trade, maybe a mentor who's helped you along the way, a coach, a teacher, a family member who helped support you um, to start this business and has supported you along all the years that you've been making it success. Who is helping you? Maybe a coworker who helps you when the days get busy. Um, who can you write a, a letter of gratitude for? And two, um, maybe it's a neighbor who helps watch your kids when the day go, goes late at work and you can't pick them up from daycare, right? A significant other who supports you even when you have to work on Saturdays, right? Maybe your own, you know, young adult children who are now um, helping, you know, your business stay a success. Who can you write a gratitude letter to today? And don't forget that those people that are even close to you, right? Like the last letter of gratitude I wrote was to my mom. Well, you know, my mom, I see her quite often. She lives not too far away. But unfortunately, we lost my father to a sudden cardiac arrest almost 19 years ago. And I wanted to take the chance before I didn't have it to tell my mom that I thought she was the strongest darn woman that I knew. I wanted to let her know that I was so thankful for her as a role model for me and my brother and sister, um, just showing us how important it was for to, you know, get be happy again after the loss of our father, to smile again, to laugh again. Um, she fell in love again years later. She got remarried. I mean, I'm just so thankful for her and the role she plays in my life. And I wanted to let her know because we never know what tomorrow's going to bring. And I didn't want to miss my chance. And then the last letter of letter, gratitude I wrote to my husband, who sleeps right beside me each day, right? Because oftentimes we forget that those people who live in our own household, that we're grateful for them because we sort of assume they know we are. But then we also have to deal with, you know, dirty dishes and clothes on the floor and, you know, other things that kind of make life kind of hectic and busy at home. But that doesn't mean I'm not grateful for him. So I wrote him a letter of gratitude and then I went to share him with him. And what's so funny is I said, Chad, I have a letter of gratitude I wrote for you. And he's like, why? And I handed it out again. And I said, I wrote a letter of gratitude for you. And he's like, how come? And I'm like, just take the darn letter, right? Sometimes sharing gratitude comes with a bit of a challenge, but we want people to know we're thankful for them. And I know it mattered because he kept the letter. When we moved a short time ago, I found the letter of gratitude I'd written to him. And that three to five minutes that it took me to write that letter of gratitude to him mattered. And maybe he rereads it. Maybe he rereads it often because maybe I should write more often, but it mattered to him so much that he kept it. And in fact, as leaders in our organizations, we can share gratitude with our coworkers, right? Our staff, the people that we manage. Um, recently, we had a, a staff member or a manager at, at Center Care come to me and say, you know what, I'm struggling. We have so much turnover in our department. We've lost some nurses. We've gained lots of new nurses, but we're not really you know, molding as a team yet. And what could I do? And I, I asked her as a leader if she'd be willing to write some letters of gratitude to her staff. 
right? So thank you note size, the, the blank cards you can get at the dollar store, right? Grab a pack of them next time you're in there. And what she said, I said to her, just write, you know, what you're, what you're grateful for them, you know, their, their skills or their personality traits or their capabilities and how happy you are for them to be part of your team. And then I said, if you could, don't just stick it in their work box, their work mailbox. I said, mail it to their home. Nothing better than receiving a, a handwritten mailed letter to your home to say that your boss supports you, your boss appreciates you. Nothing better. She circled back to me and she said, you know, Melissa, that made a huge difference. Thanks for that small tip. But think about something like that in your workspace. Could you take, you know, five, 10 minutes, um, you know, a couple of days a week where you can write a few letters of gratitude, maybe send them all at the same time so nobody feels um, slighted, right, if they don't all come in the mail the same day. But how do we share gratitude further and wider and let our people know? It's a retention tool for sure. Next slide, please. Moving on to social connections. Oh my goodness, another important piece of our resiliency is socially connecting with others in our communities. And I think we all felt this, right, during our pandemic is because our social connections, we had to hold them for a little bit early on. And I really struggled with that. Um, I'm a people person by nature and I had to go home and work from home. And here I am with my really crappy internet, apparently, um, almost two, you know, two years later. And so I struggle not being around my people because we know in our businesses and organizations, we form friendships. They're not just our coworkers. They become our friends. They become our mentors. They become our free therapy, if you will. I worked in an office of all um, same, similar age people who were, we were raising kids together, right? So they were graduating. They were applying for college. And we just helped guide each other through that process. Connections are so important. Next slide, please. After all, each and every one of us is kind of chasing happiness throughout our lives, right? We all want it. It's what we want for each other. It's what we want for our families. It's really what we want for the staff that we represent, the organizations that we own or that we manage. But how do we get it? Well, studies show that having quality relationships with other people. So perhaps you might have to push the next slide to get those to pop up. I'm not sure on your end. Um, Having quality relationships with other people is a key factor, which we're going to talk about. Being content with what life gives us, again, and then being grateful, which we just talked about at length, for what we have in our everyday lives, right? And those three factors, studies show, are the, are the tips and the tricks for a longer, healthier, happier life. And here's the ticket. None of them cost a thing. None of those three things cost anything, and they are the ways to a healthier, happier life and to live a longer life. So why don't we all inhabit those, right? So stop saying, you know what, gosh, I'll be so happy when, I don't know, when I retire one year, seven months, 14 days and eight hours, right? We've all met that person, right? The countdown begins. Or, God, you know, I'll be so happy when we can take that 30th wedding anniversary trip in a couple of years, that'll be great. Or, you know, I'll be so happy when we get all the kids raised and out of the house and we can, turn one of those bedrooms into a home office, wouldn't that be great? Well, don't get me wrong. Those are wonderful events. Those are happy moments, but they're sort of happiness hurdles at the same time, right? Because some of them are so far out in advance that we're striving through everyday life trying to get to those moments. So instead, start saying, I'm happy now because I'm healthy. I'm happy now to, because today is Friday and I got a great weekend ahead. I'm happy now today because I love fall. Fall's my favorite season and here we are, right? What makes you happy now today instead of chasing this happiness hurdle throughout life? And maybe the same is true within our organizations, right? There's often goals and priorities that we need to reach and some of them we put out far in advance, you know, by, by March, we gotta meet our, our fiscal year responsibilities, but maybe how about some shorter term goals, right? So that we can find success along the way um, and keep, keep our workers, you know, rooted and grounded and supported, even through the small steps, those small successes. And the same goes for you as a leader, right, to, to set some small goals and priorities that we can succeed along the way. Next slide, please. I want to share with you a wonderful, um, a wonderful study that kind of shows the importance of human relationships and social connections. So there's a study out there called the Harvard Study of Adult Development, and that started in 1938. And it's been going on ever since. So this is a long study with 
lots of valuable data. But in 1938, this study started with 724 guys who were in their early 20s. Half of those guys were sophomores at Harvard University, and the other half were from the toughest, poorest neighborhoods of Boston. They studied these gentlemen and throughout their entire lives. Every two years or so, checking in from a social standpoint, asking them if they were married, did they have children, where they lived, where they worked, how much money they made, things like that. Every five years or so, checking in on them from a medical perspective, looking at their medical records and their lab values and their vital signs and surgeries they've had, medications they took, and eventually CT scans and MRIs of their brain. And as they watched through time, as the study continued, they noticed that there was a certain group of individuals that outlived the rest of their peers by 10 to 20 years. They lived 10 to 20 years longer and they wanted to find out why. Let's get to the bottom of this, they said. So looking at back at all the valuable data, what they noticed the common denominator was within, within that group of people who lived longer was that they had quality relationships with other people who could support them through life's toughest moments. And that was it. It turns out it did not matter where they lived, what job they held, or how much money they made, or what their cholesterol level was at age 50. None of that mattered as much as if they had people in their lives that could help them through challenging moments. Isn't that amazing? And let it be a lesson to all of us, right? That we need these people in our lives, those people who can help support us when we're, at our, when we're feeling at our worst or when we're facing challenges that we can't overcome. Those are the people we need in our everyday lives. So let that be a lesson to all of us because we know in this life that loneliness is bad for our health. We know that living with loneliness increases our odds of dying early by 45%. 45%, obesity is 20%, and we thought that was bad. But it turns out loneliness causes the same amount of damage to your lifespan as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Now, we always knew that smoking was bad for our physical health, but it turns out that loneliness is just as harsh. Loneliness is associated with higher risk of high blood pressure, especially in our older individuals, makes it harder to recover from illnesses, especially our mental health concerns, which are so much um, higher in our communities today. So how do we make sure that people are connected? Next slide, please. We know that humans are wired for true social connections, right? As mentioned, people are living longer if they have strong relationships with other people. But unfortunately, 40 to now 60% of Americans are lonely at any given time when surveyed. When we ask, people are reporting that they're lonely that often. That's over half of our country, right? That's a lot of lonely people. So think within your business or your organization or within your coworker group, that might mean that one of them or two or many amongst them might be lonely at any given time. So how do we make sure that we encourage connection? So Bounce Back Project, we have something what we call 4 a.m. friends. So do you have any 4 a.m. friends? Who are those people in your life that you could literally call at four in the morning if you needed them to give you a ride to the emergency room? If you needed them to help you with a roadside emergency because you're all alone, right? If you needed to call them on a day where you can't imagine even one more day, right? Think about that doctor I told you about who took his life at work that day. What would happen if he would have walked into work that day and somebody looked at him and said, hey, hey, do you want to have lunch today? Who knows? It might have been a whole different day, right? We'll never know because we never know when somebody's to that day where they're so overwhelmed and, and can't handle moving forward, right? So how do we make sure that doesn't happen? Because people aren't talking about loneliness. Like nobody's sitting in the break room at work going, lonely over here. Nobody's, nobody's saying that. It's kind of like a taboo subject for whatever reason, right? And we know right now in this world that social media makes feelings of loneliness worse because we are comparing ourselves to someone else's highlight reel of life, right? As we're looking at, you know, Facebook or whatever it might be, Instagram or whatnot, we're seeing all these lovely pictures of people who are going on vacation and, and buying new houses and, and winning awards and all these wonderful things. But really, we're only seeing the highlight reel of their lives, right? If we're true to ourselves, they're human beings just like the rest of us. Um, we just have to know that we have to write our own story. Like, what is your story? 
don't worry about keeping up with the Joneses or what everyone else is doing. Just worry about you because those, the people that love you most are going to be happy with the story that you present, right? Because comparison will kill our joy every single time. So what you want to make sure that we are forming connection in the true and authentic way. Next slide, please. I'm just going to summarize the four tools that we talked about this morning. Random acts of kindness. Don't forget, throw out a challenge to your coworkers, to your staff, right? To do kindness within your organization, within your building, and out in our communities. Because it increases your happiness for up to two weeks. No problem with that. That's a win for sure. How about writing down three good things every day? Start today. You've already got your one good thing, right, that we entered into the chat. Print out that copy when Lori emails it your way and hand it out to your staff and then encourage them, if nothing else, to join our text messaging three good things campaign. Increase our happiness for up to the next six months. Consider writing a letter of gratitude and do it in the next couple of weeks, right? When you go to the dollar store, buy packages of blank cards. Maybe give two to your staff, right? Send a, a letter of gratitude, one professionally, one personally. Maybe exchange names so everybody gets a letter of gratitude. Um, because there's lots of great things we can say about each other, even if we don't know people that much personally. I appreciate that you're on work, that you're always to work on time. I appreciate that you you get your work done each and every day without without any question. You know, we can express gratitude, increasing our happiness for the next six months. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, staying connected. Connected um, people are happier physically and mentally healthier and live longer. We know that from our studies. So next slide. So what's next? What do you do as a leader, as a boss, as a business owner do next? Well, probably if you can seek to reclaim a healthy work-life balance, right? Take that time off, right? You've earned it. You're entitled to it. Make sure you're doing it. Share kindness. Throw kindness around like confetti, right? As the saying goes, share kindness. Um, start writing down your three good things. Find three good things each and every day. Be one to encourage social connections within your organization because that will help decrease conflict and help managing challenging situations because we have people who are connected and are working together to, um, to support each other. Make sure to practice self-care, right? What can you do to take care of you? Take that time you need to find something you enjoy. Go hunting, go fishing, listen to music, take a run, Pet the dog, um, you know, go look at old cars, whatever it is that makes your heart happy. Practice self-care. Set realistic boundaries, right, within your workplace. You're the boss, certainly, but there's other people that you can delegate, delegate tasks to. You can delegate them finding answers to concerns or questions within your organization. Make sure that you're using your whole staff to the best of their abilities. Pursue your purpose. Pursue your passion. Those that take you outside of the professional realm. What do you like to do? Do you want to volunteer? Do you want to help mentor kids um, in reading or coach basketball or help out at your church? What would you like to do outside of work? And then if you could possibly identify a trusted colleague, maybe somebody who's on the call today that's maybe not internal to your organization, but they can become, you guys can become 4 a.m. friends for each other, right? Because then you have someone that you can share some of those really tough moments with that's in your same, at your same realm, right? That, that knows exactly what you're talking about because they too are in that same position, right? Let's do that for each other. Next slide, please. So how do you learn more and stay informed with what Bounce Back is up to? There's that phone number again that you can text Bounce Back to if you wanna be part of our text messaging campaign. We're on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram under Bounce Back Project, and then certainly our website, bouncebackproject.org has a ton of resources. It has lots of great stuff that you can print out, PowerPoints that you can share, um, different things to stay informed with about what, what Bounce, Back, Bounce Back Project is up to in our communities. I'm gonna go have you go to the next slide. If this is a message that resonates with you or perhaps a message that you wanna share further, maybe you want one of your HR staff or a, a workplace wellness committee to be aware of Bounce Back Project, we do host these free train the trainer sessions and we just held one yesterday, but there's another coming up in January and that's free, it's virtual, so people can join from anywhere. And the, really what we're doing is we wanna expand our outreach, find some local champions who learn more about the message of Bounce Back Project and then kind of bring it back, bring it back to your organization, bring it back to your community, um, to the group that you serve. So 
we'd love for anybody to join that and they just go to the website and they can um, register to join that free virtual offering. And then our last slide, please. Here we go, right? We are bouncing back. We are bouncing back together. Um, so here we are, we're doing this, we're, we're winning, um, we're getting back to, you know, looking forward to the future and what we can